Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. Hey, what's up, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Social Jello with Angelo. Uh, before I get into the topic of today's show, I just want to thank Tune in Radio for letting me jump on to their service and broadcast my podcast. So, there's one more radio station to check out on top of Last FM and Blueberry. You can also listen to my podcast now on Tune in Radio. Download the app, listen for free. Um, I think that's about it I have for my ads for today. Uh, please, if you can, check out the Amazon link on my website at www.socialjello.com. Shop from Amazon from my site. It gives me a little cash on the side. And subscribe to my YouTube at the Social G. All right, let's get started with the show. So today's episode is about how I handled, or maybe misappropriately handled, my father passing away. And um, it's been, it's been about, it's been almost eight years now. And uh, his, his, he passed away on December 8th, on on, uh, on the 8th of, of December in 2008, I believe 2008, I think it was. So it's been almost... Or 2009, sorry, 2009. So it's been almost almost 10 years, right? Eight years right now. But to kind of open up the show and kind of give you an idea of uh, of what my uh, what my dad was like, I have a quick quote here that I posted on Instagram the other week, and uh, it goes a little something like, let's see here, give me a sec. All right. Listen to this. When I die, I don't want anybody lighting any candles or praying or putting up a picture of me and talking to it. All I want you to do is just hang out with your friends and enjoy life like you always have. Angel Luis Ferrer. So his philosophy, he died young, you know. He was uh he was only he was only 59 so he didn't even make it to his 60s. Cancer took him really quick. Uh within 4 years uh the condition got worse. And I really didn't know when I first got the news and he told me that he had a tumor in his leg. I really didn't know how to take the news and I took it very lightly, you know, cuz my my dad was always a fighter. This is a guy who who loved riding motorcycles, and when I was uh, when I was a teenager, he fell off his bike and broke his collarbone. And even though he broke his collarbone, he continued to go to work like nothing happened, um, with a broken collarbone. And he was a mechanic, so it's not exactly the easiest kind of work to do, in going in and and doing that kind of work with a broken collarbone. So it was really physical and it didn't stop him. He's, he wasn't the kind of guy that would give up easily. So when when I was told that he had a tumor, uh, when he told me he had a tumor in his leg and that uh, and they suspected it was cancer, I just kind of, I just kind of put it in a point where I felt that he would just fight it off. Like he always had, like he has everything else in his life. He fought everything off. Um, my uh, my parents got divorced when I was maybe first, they got separated when I was like nine the first time. They got two bad separations and and a final divorce later. And he got through that. My my mom remarried and he never remarried and he never ever complained about being in a in a the position he was in as a single man, uh, as a single father. Um, he had dual custody, but towards the end of it, my father was the one who who mostly took over the custody and taking care of me as I got older. And it just kind of caught me by surprise. I I uh I wasn't 
expecting him to be passing away. When he gave me the news, I took it, like I said, I took it lightly. And uh, I was I was in the middle of going to school. I was in college at the time. And I just thought that uh, he would get through it like he did everything else. And I saw someone who was very healthy uh, for, and within, within five years, within the first year, they had to amputate his leg. And even when they amputated his leg, he kept fighting. He, he didn't, he wasn't one of those people that stayed at the hospital. He said he fucking hated hospitals. So he, he, he didn't want to stay at a hospital. He didn't want to be bedridden. And he decided he would be at home the whole time. And he put on his own, uh, they, he, they gave him a, one of those prosthetic legs, a real cheap one, and he hated it because he said he couldn't use it to ride motorcycles. So what he decided to do was he, he as, an, as, a mechanic, as a mechanic and a good idea of engineering, he made his own prosthetic. He, he, he got together part, he grabbed the parts that they had, took, it, took apart the leg, looked the mechanics of it, and he found a way to create, create his own prosthetic leg that he could use uh, to ride a motorcycle. And he kept riding, even with a missing leg. Which made the situation, in my opinion, to seem like less, I guess, not as heavy as I thought as it ended up becoming. Um, but it, it slowly, uh, the cancer did get worse. And, and the ultimate fact was that he finally did lose that battle and that was a real that was a real difficult thing for me to see someone that I've always seen as one of the strongest charactered people that I knew in my life kind of deteriorate and waste away and finally look like an old man because he didn't look like an old man people always told him at the age of 50 that he looked like a 40 year old because of the kind of stuff water skiing motorcycle riding um I mean the guy just didn't didn't plan he you know he didn't plan on retiring for another 20 years that uh, was just one of those guys so so he died and uh it kind of we we saw it coming they had to put him into hospice luckily hospice didn't last that long and I, I say that because it was really difficult to we did hospice at home so I got to see him every day slowly dying and it only lasted a week because that was that was probably the worst time for me was working with the nurse. He had a little bell that he would ring when he needed his medication, bringing him his medication and seeing him in pain and suffering. And having that conversation with him before he went into hospice, he, he told me the quote I mentioned earlier. And he followed that with a, a, a letter that he gave me for a, a DSR, which is a, do not... Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, D a DR in, in the hospital terms, which is do not resuscitate. In other words, if he gets in a position where he can't continue on his own, he did not want to be put on life support. That was his, that was his biggest thing. Because he went through his own deal with his father, who died of Alzheimer's, who got put on life support for years and um, continued to live his life as a vegetable. And my father saw what it did to his family and what it did to his mother financially and, and, and emotionally. And he didn't want that. So he told me specifically that if he ended up in a position where he couldn't breathe on his own, he couldn't take care of his own bodily functions, that he immediately told me to pull the plug. It's something that I did not want to hear. But to follow his wishes when he went into hospice, when he chose, that's why he chose hospice. He could have chosen some more radiation therapy, but we went through already so many sessions of it that he was just sick of it all. And uh, yeah, uh, within the first week, um, his lungs could no longer breathe on their own. The cancer had spread into his lymph nodes and uh, into his lungs, so he ended up with lung cancer. Coincidentally, the guy never smoked in his life, but... Uh, I guess that's how that works. And um, yeah, and and he had to be put on life support because his lungs were filling up with fluid. And the doctors told me that uh, they can put him on life support to keep his lungs functioning, but that he would no longer be able to. They weren't sure if he was going to gain consciousness again. 
and that he was going to be they that we had the option of making him feel comfortable as he passed away or we can put him on life support and kind of keep it, keep him in a uh, in and out of state but the cancer was still going to get to him the, the, his lungs were kind of he was going to have to be hooked up to a machine and they weren't sure how much consciousness he'd have and he was going to be hooked up to a machine and they said they saw the letter that he wrote they said he did not want to be he didn't want to be resuscitated if he went down and he went down and um and they had me make the final decision which was one of the hardest decisions i ever made in my life was to let go of him so where does it go from there i studied psychology so you would think that I'd be equipped to deal with something like that, right? At that time, I was actually in the middle of my finishing up my undergraduate, done a lot of research on my own to prepare for it. And psychologists talk about the five stages of grief and loss, right? This is actually from a book that was established, uh, proposed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in 1969. And in her book, <coughs> excuse me, I'm fighting a cold, <clears throat> on death and dying, she talked about these five stages of, of grief when someone, you lose someone. You have uh, denial and isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So within those stages, I'm sure you've seen this on plenty of pop cultural psychology books and TV shows tend to talk about it a lot and during this denial stage. But one stage that I think is missed amongst and not talked about often is the sixth stage, which is the topic of this podcast, drinking. And it's interesting because in psychology, what they say is when someone dies, within six months to a year after the person dies, the people dealing with the trauma are not to be diagnosed with a mental disorder because psychologists realize that within six months to a year, they're going to deal with a lot of shit that would put them <laughs> hitting categories for several mental disorders. So they like to wait six months to a year afterwards before they actually diagnose them. So if after a year of losing someone, they still have any problems, then they can diagnose them. And if after that, if the person still has any lingering problems like depression or anxiety <clears throat> or, or anything like that, then they'll diagnose them with a psychological disorder if it persists. And... That's, of course, after the person's gone through grievance counseling. So I knew right away that I had a lot to deal with. I, I, I've talked about it on the podcast that I didn't exactly have the best upbringing. And because of that, I studied psychology. And I went to counselors for my mom and all kinds of stuff. So dealing with my dad's death wasn't easy. And I knew that the, I knew from my past with drinking that drinking could become an issue and um, my past with drinking. And again, I don't want to be a fucking prude because I know that a lot of psychologists can be prudes. They are. A lot of them are. I'll be right flat out 100% tell you. Many psychologists are religious and they kind of have this weird thing where kind of like they combine the <clears throat> their views on... They try to separate the two because they're scientists and we a lot of them do. I'm not going to... I'm not going to judge people here and say that psychologists are all prudes. But I am going to say that uh, many of them do come from m more conservative backgrounds. And what will happen a, a lot with the topic of alcohol is a, a divide in the camps between some psychologists that feel like, like the, the, that alcoholism is defined by drinking every day, even one drink, to, okay, well, alcoholism is defined as 
having a drinking problem as in you drink so much that you can't function and it's affecting your personal relationships. Now, the second definition is the one that the American Psychological Association uses to define alcoholism. Um, the one I talked about before where you can't even have one drink, that comes for AA, which uh, no offense to anybody who listens to my show. If AA is helping you, by all means, that's awesome. It's, it's, it, does, it does work for some people. But uh, even people in AA, you can kind of see that cross between... Uh, religion and and uh and some psychological ideas i guess counseling i don't want to use the word psychology counseling so you can see this cross between counseling and religion in an aa program hence the praying and the religious aspects to that <clears throat> not to knock it just saying uh from the psychology standpoint that's a little bit different but uh at the same time still a lot of psychologists are very aware about drinking and I don't want to come out and say something like uh, drinking is is bad or you know, drugs are bad. Okay, like I, I don't want to come off like that. <laughs> and I don't exactly want to come off as saying that there isn't any type. There is. I want to recognize that there is some people that do suffer from alcoholism, and I've met them, and uh, and I've had my problems with drinking, but according to the psychology, like the psychology definitions of alcoholism. I've never let drinking get in the way of my relationships or my work life. And that's not to say that I didn't have issues with drinking, because I did. When I was younger, I had some big issues with drinking, or I was drinking every day. I was, uh, I was drinking just enough. And not, when I say drinking every day, I don't mean having a beer after work I'm or a glass of wine before you go to bed. I'm saying <clears throat> I'd wake up in the morning, take three shots of rum, or put rum in my coffee, and that was my get, that was my go-to before I go to work. <clears throat> then I go to work, and then at lunchtime I would drink again. So I mean, arguably, I'm really I was really skating that definition of of alcoholism because even in the psychology textbooks they say if you have I think more than two or three drinks in an hour it's considered binge drinking. So I guess right there I'm binge drinking every day. Uh, why did I do that when I was younger? Well. You know, I had a lot of shit that I was dealing with back then too, as far as uh, dealing with my parents' divorce and the, and the and some physical abuse as a kid and uh, and the crazy religion, uh, being brought up as a Jehovah's Witness and getting out of that shit and losing everyone, losing all my friends, having to make new friends, feeling socially isolated. <clears throat> so, again, uh, I knew that I had a lot of baggage, and I went through that already, and I dealt with those demons, and I and I pretty much defeated them in a way and I, I I went on a cleanse not because anybody told me to not because I was married and not because anybody asked me to stop drinking I just wanted to see when I was studying psychology this is before my dad died this is right in the beginning of his prognosis um, <clears throat> I just wanted to see if it, if I could is it possible and it's because I actually got challenged by a psychology professor who uh, I was an honor student and he asked me, and if, you, if you've heard the story before in my other podcast, I'm sorry, I'm just relevant to what I'm doing now, so <laughs> I'll say it again. Um, he, he asked me, I, I got a, for the first time in, in my coursework, and especially in psychology, I got my first B. I had an 89% on a test, and it was in physiology. And it was a really fucking hard course. I had to do, it had a lot to do with anatomy and, uh, and chemistry. Uh, a mix of like anatomy and biology, <clears throat> which was, uh, I was more of the theoretical based psychology major looking more at not so much neuroscience, but at how different counseling techniques can help people. And I wasn't really looking at how the brain is affected. So my knowledge in the field was my first physiology. No, it was my, yeah, it was my first physiology course. I've taken anatomy before, but it was an advanced physiology course mostly doctors and nurses in the class, or future pre-med students. And I was upset that I got an 89, and he, he said, hey, so do you party? And I'm like, what do you mean? I don't really go to parties. No, you know, I'm older. I'm, I was about 24 at the time. I don't really have time to party. I work full time. He's like, all right, well, do you drink? I said, well, yeah, I drink. I drink. You know, I drink on, you know, I, have, I, 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 I occasionally hang out and have some drinks at night and whatever. And at that time, I kind of lied because I was. I was drinking every day. <clears throat> in the morning, like I said, taking shots before I go to work. 
And uh, he said, well, if you stop drinking, it's going to help with your memory. And I'm pretty sure if you did that, you can get 100% on these tests. Now, you don't have to do anything. You can you can continue. I mean, you obviously, an 89, if you finish my course and you still have an 89, you'll still be an honor student. And I, I got kind of upset because I was thinking to myself, I don't have a drinking problem. That's what I thought to myself. I don't have a drinking problem. But to prove this guy, to prove to this guy, not so much to this guy, but to prove to myself, and I never even told him I did it. I said, all right, I'll keep that in mind. And I, and I left. I, I left his office. I said, you know what? Fuck it. Let's see. If I really have a drinking problem, according to everything that the textbooks say, when I stop drinking, I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a really hard time. I should be getting shakes, withdrawal. I should be suffering from withdrawal symptoms. That's the first thing I thought to myself. So if I see myself going through withdrawal symptoms, getting feeling sick, feeling nauseous, um, then I know that I, I really did. I had a drinking problem, and I need to I need to face that. That's what I thought to myself. I'll have to face that. Funny thing happened is I didn't get any. I really didn't get any withdrawal symptoms. I stopped drinking the next day and uh, just kept doing what I always do. I, I'm really into physical, I'm really into uh, physical exercise. I, used, I surfed back then in California. I would go surfing every day and, and I'd go to the gym at night and do martial arts. I didn't, I still do martial arts. So like for me, it wasn't a really difficult transition. If anything, my friends were the ones who were like, dude, why are you doing this? You know, you're know, you you're more fun at parties when you're drinking. I'd still go to the parties, the barbecues. I'd still go out to the social functions. I just wouldn't drink. I would drink soda, I'd drink diet soda or water, and just hang out. And my friends would tell me, I, I, you know, some of my friends would say, like, well, I can't wait till you start drinking again because, you know, it, it's weird to have you hanging out just sober all the time. <laughs> but um, really, that's... That's how I was. In AA, they would say I have to get rid of my friends, and I wasn't about to do that because I really didn't want to get rid of any. I already went through that with the whole Jehovah's Witness thing. I'm not going to do that again. So I did. I tested it out. I went uh, I went three months, not one drink. And then after that, I started, I started drinking again. But when I came back to my drinking, I, I didn't start drinking the way I used to. I, I definitely stopped drinking in the morning before I go to work. And uh, and I was no longer taking shots of of uh, of Bacardi every day um, right after I finished work, you know, meeting up with my friends, having three shots of Bacardi. Um, I kind of took it down to more of the, you know, a beer after work or a glass of wine before bed, that kind of thing. So I was kind of worried that when my dad passed, that I would go back to that. I would go back to that old me that would drink in the morning. So immediately, I challenged myself and I told all my friends, you know, right now I'm dealing with my father passing away and I don't want to end up in a bad place, so I'm going to stop drinking again. And uh, they, said, well, you, they said, we respect that, you know, and, uh, and I stopped drinking for a few months after. And when I came back, uh, I started drinking again and it kind of snuck up on me. I didn't. This time around, you know, it was about three months after his death. Of course, after he died, I had the party. Um, I didn't decide to make this decision. I, I knew that I needed to mourn a little bit. So we, we had a party. Like my dad told me, too. He said, don't don't have a memorial service. Just have a hang out with your friends like you always do. So I did. You know, I, I had a had a barbecue at my friend at my neighbor's house. Who was also my my Sifu, my martial arts instructor. And we had some drinks and did some speeches and no pictures of my dad. I respected all his wishes. And uh, that was the last night that I drank. After that, I went three months without drinking. And when I started drinking again after that, the reason I say it snuck up on me is because it started off with me just having a few beers after work. I, had, I would have two beers after work. You know, and it turned into as a week went by, two weeks went by, it just got easy to finish work and to have three beers after work. And then after the three beers, go home, make dinner. And then after dinner, drink uh, half a bottle of wine. So now we're talking a little more considerable amounts of alcohol, right? 
Um, and I would drink strong beer. I, I didn't like Budweiser or any of that bullshit. No offense to Budweiser, or if you like Budweiser. Uh, I like drinking microbrewery, microbrewery beer. Uh, I preferred uh, brands like Stone, pay, uh, IPAs, Indian Pale Ale from uh, from a local microbrewer in San Diego. And I, would, I loved going to breweries. That was my thing. Uh, I volunteered for the Surfrider Foundation and a lot of their, uh, the way they would thank the volunteers at the end of the year is that they would let us have a, kind of an all-you-can-drink taster. So I, I would volunteer at these festivals, beer festivals, and I'd, I'd serve beer as a beer bartender. <laughs> and uh, and I wouldn't drink at these functions because if you drank, you'd get in trouble. So I wouldn't drink. And then at the end of the, of the year, we'd have this thing where we can come in and uh, and we could we could have this party. They'd have a party for us, and we can taste the beers that we've been serving all year. But you know, still like yeah, I really love going to breweries. So every day I would go to a brewery and have a few beers after work. And uh, and it turned into this thing where I was drinking quite a bit again. Now was it affecting my relationships? Nah, it wasn't affecting my relationships. I wasn't I wasn't drinking to get drunk. I was I would have two. One or two drinks. I was a bigger guy back then. I was about 96 kilograms, about 200 pounds. So I could easily drink two beers and still drive. And then I'd go home and have two or three more beers. And that's what the problem was, right? I'm drinking Now I'm drinking about five to six beers a day. And financially, that's drinking microbrew, that's, that can get expensive. We're talking about you know $20 a day on beer, which does add up. You know, when you start calculating that to the month, you're drinking like that every day. You know, it would it would get to about about three hundred to four hundred dollars in alcohol a month. So yeah, financially, it definitely wasn't good. Um, I could have you know, some will argue, hey, you had a good time. It's you you get what you paid for, and I did make enough money to to use that money for that. But at the same time. And it was again. It wasn't affecting my relationship, according to the APA. According to the, unless I felt I had a problem, according to the American Psychological Association, unless someone else told me, "Hey, this is a problem." So if my wife would have said, "Hey, I don't like your drinking. Uh, I want you to stop," and we got into an argument about it, or if we got into arguments about my drinking, or if I were to have those two or three beers, and then start get you know, berserking, getting angry and breaking things, or if my attitude changed, then we have a problem. But uh, I didn't have those issues. Uh, if if anything, I just get really relaxed, really friendly. And that was it. And if I wasn't drinking, I wouldn't become irritable. So again, psychologically speaking, I didn't fit the profile to say that I had a drinking problem. Now, according to AA, if you went to AA meetings, oh, right now, if you're, if you're listening to this and you go to AA, you're like, oh, this guy's in denial about being an alcoholic. So, you know, again, it just depends on the definitions you have. But I will say that it did sneak up on me, and I didn't really analyze it until I came out to Japan. When I moved out to Japan five years ago, I realized, uh, again, it has to affect relationships, right? So in Japan, the laws are different from California. They have a zero tolerance law. It's cra- It's weird. Like, you're allowed to drink in public. They do not have a law against drinking in public. You can get drunk as fuck and throw up on a cop. I've seen it. Fucking people throwing up on cops. Cops, cops, like, apologizing to a drunk person after they threw up on them for telling them that they, they can't, they can't be near the train platform because they're going to fall in front of a train. Literally, cops helping cleaning up people, not arresting them because they don't have a drink, drinking, uh, drunken public law. So I don't want you to think that Japan's this place that has these rules. It's actually really lax when it comes to public intoxication. But they are zero tolerant when it comes to drinking and driving. And that's where things got kind of, kind of sketchy for me. So I like to have a drink or two right? I'd have a beer or two after work. Well, now it's a problem. Because if I had a beer or two after work, and then I needed to drive, well, I can't drive because it's illegal because they have a zero tolerance law. Most people don't have this problem because they live in the city and they can take a book, they can bus or train it, but I can't, couldn't. And immediately, um, I started seeing, I started having relationship issues with my, uh, 
with my wife. That's a, oh yeah, with my wife. My wife was, my wife was saying that, uh, like I, I was gonna go surfing. I was gonna go surfing uh, on one occasion, and when I was getting ready to go surfing, the the next day, I decided the night before, hey, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have two beers. And I had a, I'm gonna have a tall boy. Like I, they had a, they have this large can of Asahi, which is about equivalent to two beers. And uh, her parents are like, "What's he doing?" And he's like, hey, "He's gonna have a beer. He can't drink. He's gonna go surfing." And I was like, "That's tomorrow. Like it's <laughs> in a few hours. You know, tomorrow." Like, yeah, but you're leaving at three or four in the morning to go surfing. And if you have any alcohol in your system, they can they can really come down on you. And, you know, you, you can get deported. And um, I got pissed and I got, I, I, you know, I didn't argue, but I was pretty angry about being told that I couldn't drink on a Friday night at, uh, at 11 o'clock at night. And I got into a big stinking fight with, not fight, but, uh, but I got angry and I walked away. I didn't drink the beer, but I was pretty pissed off about it. And I, you know, my, me and my wife got an argument about it and she said, you know, it's, you're not, you're not in America anymore. So things are different and I was pretty resentful of that and uh, I started thinking about like how in California it was this great thing to drink beer after work that's what I did I would hang out with my friends and drink beer and I always said I was a social drinker but now here I am in Japan my wife doesn't drink nobody around me drinks so I'm pretty much drinking alone and that's when I realized that uh yeah, I have a drinking problem. I have an issue. It's creating relationship issues. Uh, my wife is saying that I shouldn't be drinking every day after work because I might have to drive somewhere. And uh, I got into an argument about it. So kind of just thinking about it from that perspective, I realized that something needed to be done. Something needed to change. And that change came about when I realized that I don't, I don't have to drink every day after work. And I changed my drinking pattern. I used to drink beer every day, <clears throat> which was not that great for, for other reasons, uh, health reasons. So I, I stopped drinking beer uh, every day. And uh, I started drinking beer only if I went to a party or a uh, social gathering with with co-workers or friends after that i also added a rule that if i'm going to drink at home besides you know i was getting more into semi-professional amateur fighting so i needed to cut weight anyway and uh it made it easy i decided i had to focus on that up the exercise and started work, focusing more on having a good routine in the morning i'd wake up I'd work out, go to work, after work. At the time, I wasn't working as an English teacher. I was working, as, uh, helping out my father-in-law and his company. But after work, I wouldn't drink. I would just finish work, and I would wait till uh, till the end of the night. And at that point, I would I would have one drink. I would have maybe a, a glass of wine. Um, and as time went by, my English teaching schedule pushed work into a different schedule even more. Where now I finish work late at night, not late, but I, I finish work at night, um, around eight or nine o'clock at night. Uh, sometimes seven thirty, no, usually around seven thirty or eight. After work, I spend time with my family, my daughter. They go to bed, and when they go to bed, I, uh, I have, uh, I, uh, I've been drinking. I have like this uh, zero calorie, zero sugar, uh, zero alcohol cocktail drink. It doesn't have any alcohol in it. I drink that with a little bit of alcohol, like that much, just like a pinch. I calculate that when I drink two cans of it with the mix I'm making, I'm pretty much having one drink of something that they call sochu, which is kind of a... Uh, kind of a, a type of sake it's kind of a wine it's a type of wine and um and then i follow that with one glass of wine so right now i'm having about 
two glasses of wine, equivalent to about two glasses of wine. And sometimes some nights just one glass of wine and go to bed. So I actually do think more about how much I drink, why I drink. And I realized that that, that, that became the sixth stage of grievance, was realizing that I did have an issue. Um, you have the five stages of the death itself, denial and isolation. And I want to say, well, maybe the sixth step has to do with the denial part. Not so much denial about the death of my father, but denial that it wasn't going to affect me. That was my denial. I was in denial that it wasn't going to affect me, and it did. And it still does. You know, I'm pushing eight years now from him being gone, and I'm still coping with with that. And um, another thing that really helped me was, was reading books uh, this one book called Returning to Silence by by Roshi Zatagiri was a really great book. And again, all the links to the information I'm talking about will be on my website. Check it out if you're interested in any of the <clears throat> research on grievance or the book I just mentioned right now. But it was a book on mindfulness and Zen Buddhism. It just made me realize that, you know, life is about changes and being able to roll with the punches, if you will. Things never stay stagnant. Things are always changing. And the biggest problem that people have in life is trying to become, is trying to accept, not just my father's death, but just accept the changes that life brings to you. You get these weird impressions that things are always going to be the same way forever. And when your expectation doesn't match reality, that's when shit hits the fan. So what do you do? If you start putting in your head that you know that things are going to change and you try your best to remain flexible and don't become attached to your desires of wanting to keep things the same, if you can let go of that, then you can let go of a lot of the suffering that comes with trying to hold on to to life perspectives that don't match to where your life is headed or is at the moment. It makes me enjoy my time that I have knowing that Things are going to change. Um, and I try not to attach things like things are going to get better or things are going to get worse. I try not to attach qualifiers to these things. That's just life. Things change. And if I can learn to let go of these desires that I have to keep things a certain way, I can be happy with the way things are going. And that's how I dealt with with uh, with that sixth stage of, of grievance, of drinking was that my desire to to want to drink a massive amount of alcohol, not a massive, but you know, my desire to want to drink beer and rum every day didn't match to where my life was or is now. It may have been it may it may have matched when I was back in California with my friends, but where I'm at now, it doesn't match. So instead of when I had that argument, that first argument with my wife about not being able to drink uh, the night before going surfing, <clears throat> it was me fighting on to that, latching on to that desire of my old life in California and not accepting my new life in Japan and the new changes that came along with it. So I just hope that my listeners can kind of, if you can anything, kind of walk away from this story is, you know, so whenever you go through a loss, whether it be through your relationships or if you lose a loved one, or even if you change jobs, any of these changes are considered miniature things that you're losing, and there's going to be a grievance process that goes with it. If you can be aware of it, you can be able, hopefully, to control it and not let it control you. Either way, thanks for tuning in to Social Jello. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to try my best to, again, bring you two podcasts a month. And if you have any questions, you can always hit me up at thesocialjello at gmail.com. I hope you all have an awesome week. Peace.